Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode, we speak to Angus Barge about his experience with erectile difficulties. I just remember feeling like I'd kind of been hit by a train. The lengths he went to to try and sort it out. I didn't throw the complete kitchen sink at it because I did draw short of thrashing my penis with nettles, as one blog suggested would increase blood flow. And users of Mojo, the online platform for men struggling with erectile difficulties. Quite often if you ask them the main reason they've joined, it's that they're worried about losing their partner if they can't get it out. Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Degree Waite and as ever, I'm joined by accredited sex and relationship therapist, Kate Campbell. Hello, Mum. Hello, Diggs. Each episode, Mum and I give a different aspect of sex and relationships, a good going over the guests. And today we're doing just that. We'll be discussing erectile difficulties. And that's what we need to do, because as we'll discover from our guests later, as they tell us, talking about it with other men is what's really, really effective. Absolutely. An erectile problem happens to most men, if not all men at some point and it's often just due to tiredness or being a bit run down or having drunk too much and once it's happened once then people start to worry about it and they think they're the only person it's ever happened to. So what Angus wants to do is to make it clear that it it can happen really easily, that you can get into a pattern of worry, which Mm. makes it worse and makes then the the anxiety is what makes it happen. And so then you think there's something really, really seriously wrong. I mean, having said that, when we talked about testosterone on a previous podcast, we did emphasise that sometimes erectile difficulties can be a sign of an underlying health problem. Mm. So it's always worth getting it checked out if it keeps on happening. But a good sign is if you're still getting early morning erections and it's mainly with a partner that Mm. you tend to lose your erection or can't get it in the first place, then that tends to suggest anxiety. But it's always worth getting it checked out. Absolutely. And the thing is, right, is ages ago we were talking about it and I I realised you kept referring to it as erectile difficulties Mm. Was that a conscious choice? Because obviously most people know it yes. as erectile dysfunction. So why why do you refer to it as difficulties rather than dysfunction? Which sounds more like something you'd want to have. Difficulties. Dysfunction yeah. sounds like the the very function, the one yeah. function you have, it's yeah. dis. It's not working. That's all you've got to do. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't bloody work. And yeah. yeah, it's useless. I think it's horrible. Um, mm. Erectile dysfunction sounds horrible. But I mean, there, there are so many horrible medical terms to describe things which are really common and not that much of a problem. And erectile difficulties affect everybody. So when you call it at some point, as I say, because you're tired or whatever, if you start calling it a big, long medical name, it sounds like a really terrible, awful thing when mm. actually it is a minor difficulty for most people. A difficulty implies that, you know, with a, enough hard work and the and the right know-how will get over it you know yeah. we all have difficulties but they're difficulties they're not impossible tasks to overcome a dysfunction makes me think oh blimey you know there's there's no chance yeah and you can still call it ed as well whether it's a difficulty or a dysfunction exactly so to discuss ed with us in more detail is co-founder of mojo an online platform that collates all the information you might need in tackling ed into one place angus barge of mojo thank you so much for joining us thanks so much for having me it is our absolute pleasure mm-hmm. it's our absolute pleasure so can you tell us for the people at home that maybe don't know what mojo is i like to describe mojo as kind of the sex expert in your pocket we're a a platform for guys that are struggling with psychogenic erection issues i.e problems caused by something psychological and we're aiming to kind of provide people with support that doesn't go down this kind of medication first approach. So we work with a lot of psychosexual therapists and sexual well-being professionals to kind of help men overcome any kind of psychological issues in the bedroom. And yeah, it, there's been an exponential rise in, I don't like to call them sexual dysfunctions, but sexual issues in young, healthy men. I think in 
the year 2000, there was trials run and it would be kind of three to five percent of under 40s had ever struggled getting it up in the bedroom. Mm. By 2011, 12, those figures were up at kind of 35 percent of millennials. So it's been a huge rise in the incidences of this. And I think that can be caused by any number of things, but generally it's all underpinned by some form of anxiety, Mm. whether that's around your own body, who you're sleeping with, general kind of social stresses, what's going on in your life. But yeah, it's it's a very kind of nuanced problem and I don't think there's a one size fits all and it certainly doesn't come in blue pill form. Mm. Mm. Yes, blue pills being Viagra and stuff, right? Because Viagra used to not be over the counter and now it is and I think a lot of people turn to that and Mojo is basically an alternative to that. Yeah, I, th- I think it was, it, was it end of 2018? Um, mm. Well, Viagra is the brand, but um, Sedanafil right. and Cialis uh, and Tadanafil are the kind of now the over-the-counter erection medications mm. and they became non-prescription now about three years ago and there was just a boom in pastel coloured adverts with handsome young guys telling you that sexual problems weren't just for old guys and you should be the best partner you can be and you should just take pills and I I think it was that kind of messaging that actually kind of propelled Xander and I to start Mojo and kind of Mm. offer another solution yes so you mentioned Zander there that's your he's your cousin right my cousin and co-founder so it is strange with the the business came from I opened up to Zander's when we were on kind of a long car journey and I told him kind of staring into the very far distance out the passenger <laughs> window that I'd been struggling to get it up for the previous kind of six months and it had absolutely rocked my world I mm. guess I'd kind of thought of myself as a really mentally robust young man but this had kind of really shaken me to my core and then he paused for ages <laughs> and I mean he said stuff it I know exactly what you're talking about I've been struggling on and off with that throughout my 20s and there was something kind of so powerful in that conversation that we really knew we were onto something but yeah, it took us a long time to pluck up the courage to turn that conversation into action and decide to be kind of a face of erectile dysfunction, if you like. <laughs> yeah, but we're so glad that you have done. So then for you personally, like, when did you notice something wrong? You said it was six months. When when did things start going awry? Uh, for, for, for me, I had kind of an interesting case, which was what the beginnings of my issues were something physical Mm. i'd basically signed up to a really stupidly long endurance cycling race Mm. um called the mallorca 312 and it got to about six weeks before the event and i hadn't done any training and realized that i was going to be in real trouble if i tried to cycle for kind of 13 hours straight so I joined a gym in London and you go in it's this amazing gym it's got a bank of bikes which are all screwed into the floor and a huge screen in front of you and there's loads of guys in there who are totally fanatical about bikes and cycling and lycra and (laughs) basically you you have all their stats up on the wall in front of you so it gets very competitive and I basically did that for an hour and a half every morning and an hour and a half every night for six weeks and yeah I remember it all seems so stupid in hindsight but I remember my penis going kind of tingly numb through these sessions and I just thought nothing of it because I'd speak to the guy next to me and he'd be like, yeah, yeah, I've got that. Just just stand out of the saddle for a couple of seconds. It goes away. And then it wasn't until a few weeks after the event when I got my social life back that I went home with someone and it didn't work for kind of the first time in my life. But I put it down to booze, having been out clubbing, mm. kind of thought nothing of it. But then when it happened again in the morning when we were sober... I just remember my stomach being in my mouth and feeling like I'd kind of been hit by a train. So yeah, in in hindsight, it was kind of obvious what had happened to me, but even then it didn't feel like I knew where this had come from Mm -hmm. and what should have taken kind of six to 12 weeks to naturally fix itself. That was kind of crushed blood vessels in my perineum. Probably I struggled relatively acutely for kind of almost a year. Wow. And so when you first had that, like, 
how did you go about working out what was going on? The way I think most men will approach a problem in the bedroom, which is turning to Dr. Google. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> saying that, I think a lot of guys will live in denial and pretend there isn't anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be if you start kind of avoiding sex, but that's obviously a very unhealthy approach to have to relationships. But yeah, I, I took the approach of absolutely throwing the kitchen sink at it, which was coming up with endless hypothesis of what might be wrong with me. It might be the fact that I watched porn. Did I have an unhealthy relationship with porn? I don't know. I don't think so, but I gave it up. I'm vegetarian. Did I not have the building blocks that I needed for a testosterone? I spent a lot of money in Holland and Barrett getting <laughs> getting all the kind of natural remedies that would help your body create testosterone. Was it because I was single and didn't have a connection with the partners I was sleeping with, there was endless hypothesis and I tried them all. <laughs> and was that all stuff that you got from Google as well? You're like, oh, that maybe sounds like me or this could be the potential. Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's a lot of kind of good information on Healthline and these kind of online blogs. There's a lot of bad information as well. I didn't throw the complete kitchen sink at it because I did draw short of thrashing my penis with nettles as one Reddit <laughs> blog suggested would increase wow. b- blood flow. Um, So yeah, I I think it was kind of looking at the solutions and realizing there wasn't a good one. I did try Viagra and the kind of over-the-counter drugs, um, which worked and actually tremendously well by the time Mm. kind of my blood vessels had repaired. It was a psychological problem and they did do a really good job, but I always felt hollow and kind of felt like I was tricking the person I was with. So... There, there was a need for me to get to the root of it. Right. So you didn't tell them? No. No. So was that like, you'd be like, oh, I think it's going to happen here. Nip to the toilet, pop this bad boy in, and then off we go. It's not yeah, that, that quick. I mean, that, yeah, that does sound like it, it's quick. But I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges as well. And actually, I think Xander was speaking to a mate of his uh, in the pub the other day who said, oh, yeah, actually, he'd tried and he'd done it kind of on a date when it was date number whatever and he thought yeah. it was on the cards took it in the bar before they left got back to mm. hers and found himself on the sofa an hour later having got himself all excited and <laughs> oh no yeah unable to sleep wow i mean i don't want to talk about the pills too much but i guess it's good to focus on those as well as like what you're often the opposite of so what are some of the side effects of it and how does it work i think one of the things about this group of medications which are called pde5s Mm. they all work in slightly different ways but the commonality they have is that they stop blood getting out of the penis they they clench the muscles at the bottom of your penis to keep blood in Mm. but if you start to think and consider how performance anxiety works and psychogenic erection issues happen it's quite often because you're nervous and you're anxious so your body is in a state of fight or flight and it's diverted all the blood away from your digestive system and your genitals to your skeletal muscles in your brain so that you're ready to kind of run away from a bear because we still haven't really evolved Mm. beyond that so these drugs often won't work for guys who have a psychological issue because there's no blood going to their penis so there's nothing mm. to be kept in so quite often a lot of our members will come to us and say even viagra or cialis didn't work for me and i'm mm. like yeah don't worry about it it's not meant to so mm. but it can make people feel extra broken when even the drugs don't work yes and for you as you said it felt hollow is that something where yeah for me they worked tremendously well i think basically the placebo of having the drug gave me the confidence to believe it was going to happen as I wasn't in a state of fight or flight Mm. and yeah they worked kind of fantastically well but yeah there was something that felt a little bit hollow about kind of having to plan it and it all felt a little bit clinical like is it isn't it the timing you were talking about and then just doing something uh, that you're not telling the person you're with about Mm. for me it it just didn't feel like a a long-term solution no, they are good for confidence building, though. I mean, so you know, sometimes people just don't believe they can do it. And finding that it can happen is amazing. But not long term. And an awful lot of people like you feel it's cheating and that they ought to be able to do it and they shouldn't be anxious. And, they, and that's just, just beating themselves up is enough to make it never work. And, and I think what you're alluding to there as well is if you start to believe that you need them, 
and you take them over and over again, yes, these drugs don't have a chemical hook, as people would describe a drug that is addictive. They're not chemically addictive, but there's no doubt that you can build up a dependency on them, mm. which is as soon as you don't have them, you then think, oh my God, I don't have the support of these drugs that I need. Yeah. So you feel anxious and you're not going to get it up. So you've you've built up a dependency on, on the medication. But some people can't take them anyway, can they? There are unpleasant side effects like, you know, terrible gastrointestinal side effects, real feelings of indigestion, very stuffy nose, headaches, not pleasant. Not sexy, really. So in your particular journey, what solution did you end up going for? Um, I got myself a girlfriend. I think that was probably the one that helped the most because I did confront it and I did talk about it. I remember she was the first person that I'd ever spoken about my concerns of not being able to get it up with before we had sex. Mm. And I think that was really liberating and freeing and probably broke the back of it because by that time, mm -hmm. I wasn't, the blood vessels in my perineum would have fixed themselves. So I think that was what really helped was actually communicating it and not fearing it. And mm -hmm. we kind of worked on it together. And actually, it wasn't an issue with her from the start, I think, because of that conversation beforehand. Mm, that's amazing. Mm, that's so lovely. Would you encourage other men to do, to do that, to tell their partners Oh, 100%. I think we have this wrong perception that talking about any insecurities in the bedroom feels like kind of sexual suicide and that mm. someone won't want to sleep with you if you've admitted that you're anxious or nervous that you don't, well, I guess people perceive it as not know not knowing what you're doing. Mm. What's really great about it or talking about sex in general before you have it is you kind of open up a forum and I don't care how confident someone tells you that they are with sex and their ability or prowess or whatever they want to call it, it is a kind of anxiety inducing act and everyone will mm. have this or something that they would benefit from airing. So it kind of opens up that space for for both partners. Telling this to your partner, have you got any tips on, on that and, and sharing it with them? Um, pick your moment mm. and this is a tricky one because I'm basically telling you that it's not a big deal. It's going to go well. It's going to be fine. Mm. But equally, it might be a little scary and intimidating for your partner too. So make sure you pick your moment and that they're in a state or position that they want to or might be open to, to chatting about it. Mm. So I would suggest not just before you have sex, <laughs> but kind of at some point during the day when there's a moment and kind of asking them if you could share something with them mm. and if the answer is know them wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think one of the things to really, really emphasize is this kind of problem is more likely to happen when the relationship becomes closer for some mm. people. I mean, the more important the relationship is, the more you don't want to lose the person, the more you might worry that it, this could happen, the more it'll happen. So often it's in fact a compliment to the partner in a way, yeah. because it started when you started to think, oh, I'm really falling in love with this person. Yeah. And then that happens. And it's just so annoying, but it's part of relationships. It's all very confusing. It's all very hard work. It's all very difficult. It's all very scary. And we're all frightened of being abandoned, yeah. aren't we? So. And yeah, if it happens before that moment, as well I've heard loads of guys say oh but she was just so hot it was like the first time we were going back and I fancied her so much mm. and it's that the body is mixing up the feelings of excitement and anxiety treating them both the same and sending yes. you off into it is well it can do a lot of damage to relationships as well I mean if partners don't know what's going on then they start imagining what's going on and can yeah. make it a whole lot worse because of what they say, which comes from a place of insecurity. And then there's more problems, which makes the anxiety worse, which makes the erection less likely and so on and so on and so on. It's really, yeah. really difficult. And there's a huge kind of self-preservation piece as well. When it's gone wrong, I think a lot of guys, I'll, I'll put myself in this camp as well, is one of the things you hear coming out of your own mouth is, oh, this has never happened before. Mm. Oh, yeah. No, not me. Always up for it, me. Yeah. yeah and yeah. You, you don't really consider what that means to someone yeah. who's hearing it, which is what I'm the first person that you've not been able to get out with, which is hugely damaging. And Absolutely. that kind of self-preservation is actually quite selfish when you think of it that mm. way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think what is what's important to note as well is that you don't have as much control over your penis as people might think you do. Like, mm. even though obviously it is connected to your brain and your heart and stuff. Like, I remember at secondary school when I was going through puberty, that 
it was up and down like nobody's business and I didn't know what was going on. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about anything sexual. It was just mad. But that's just, that's just how it is. But as much as it is connected to your body, it's its own thing. So I think some people do have it wrong and they think, oh, well, if they can't get up, it means they don't like me. Yeah. Mm. Undoubtedly, people think that. And it's, it's really difficult. The, another thing is you get guys who don't realise that times change. You know, you can't do what you're doing at 18 when you're 35 or 30 even. You know, it can be harder to hang on to an erection. And it doesn't mean you're not aroused, but you may, there may, it may not be as hard or it may you need a bit more stimulation or something like that. And a lot of partners in general don't always understand. And certainly the person it's happening to thinks something's going wrong, worries about it, and then something goes wrong. Whereas what's needed is just a little bit more stimulation. And then from just that, from just that tiny thing can grow this enormous anxiety, which just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until there's a real problem. Are there any side effects to erectile difficulties that you think are particularly bad and definitely people should really really watch out for and and we should focus on i think one of the saddest things about sexual issues is how isolating they are and how quite often men will choose to deal with them on their own just out of shame i don't want to get too grandiose about it but i think that lack of connection and support network is kind of what is holding masculinity back or at least giving Mm. it that title of it being toxic yeah Mm. absolutely i mean men men aren't allowed to have feelings or to talk to one another or to get things wrong yeah i I really think that's right and actually uh, i think something that these brands which have popped up and are offering the kind of online medication for solutions one thing they have done very well is promote the fact that this isn't just an old guy's issue. And like I say, kind of 35% of millennials are now struggling to get it up. Mm. They have normalized it and that has been really amazing. But just seeing these stats written down is never really enough. I can appreciate that probably one in three of my mates is suffering with the same thing, but by only looking at the stat, I don't feel better about it. It's Mm. through speaking about it in connection that actually can resolve these issues and make them feel much more manageable. So yeah, by men dealing with it in isolation, does that make it worse? And yeah, I just 100% prescribe to that idea. But yeah, we have what we call Mojo Connects, which is, as we're talking now, kind of our members will get together and they'll kind of chat openly about their issue and how they're feeling and how they're incorporating some of Mojo's exercises into their life. And yeah, I've I've been on calls recently where there's such a community builds up very quickly that guys will be asking others how this first date with this girl is going and is he considering telling her that Mm -hmm. he's worried it's going to happen and then when he comes back the next week and he's told her and things have gone well, everyone is completely elated Uh and jumping up and down. It's really incredible. I've never yet seen it go badly and i'm sure it it possibly could maybe maybe it would scare someone probably through maybe an insecurity of their own that they would feel Mm. they would be uh, reflective on them but i think if it were to go badly then it's probably not the right relationship to be in anyway what would uh, what would you say to partners of people who are going through this would there be anything that you would say to them to sort of prime them or reassure them or anything like that um well first and foremost is please don't internalize it whether it's Mm. in a kind of short-term or long-term relationship it doesn't necessarily mean it's a reflection on on you you can be in a long-term relationship and it can have never been a problem and suddenly arise Mm. and it might be hard to believe that it's not something you've done or something that's changed in the relationship but it could just be something going on in the rest of a man's life I i think you said uh, degree there that your penis is something separate a little bit out of control which I agree with in in a way but also I think sometimes we treat our penis as this separate being when actually it's fully connected to who you are so you're right in saying that actually it might have nothing to do with your penis being around it might just be something else going on in your life hmm. so I guess I'd say to partners not to internalize it and it can be exceptionally hard for partners as well because quite often they want to help but don't know how to ask without thinking they'll bruise an ego or make it worse mm-hmm. or knowing where to turn well, what you meant to suggest suggesting taking medication probably feels strange and beyond the remit of 
most partners. One thing I find really incredible about the users we have and the members who join the community is quite often if you ask them the main reason they've joined, it's not what people would expect, which I think is that they want to be able to have sex and there's probably this glean of men being sex obsessed and that's all they want. Mm. They just want their erection to be fixed so they can have more sex. The most common answer I hear to that is that they're worried about losing their partner if they can't get it out, which is so sad. Mm. So sad. And I'll, I'll have that kind of initial conversation with them and talk about kind of what their goals of joining were. And I almost have to remind them that, well, do you not want sex to be fun again? Mm. Is that not something you're aiming for? And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that too. That's kind of an afterthought. Mm. Wow. But it means so much. I mean, the whole being able to do it is so important to people. I mean, they think that if they can, they're satisfying their partner, even if their partner isn't orgasming. If they're going through those stages, get it, keep Mm. it, ejaculate. If they're going through that, then they're doing the job that's required of them. And they're not really thinking about anything else. And so there's mm-hmm. so many misconceptions. I mean, they, they're just looking at other guys and thinking, well, everybody else can do it. I'm the only person in the entire world this has ever happened to. Because there are so many kind of rules about being masculine, you know, that you're just not allowed emotion. You're just are not allowed to have a problem. Definitely not allowed to talk about it. So mm-hmm. throwing that out of the window and doing all those things, talking about it, being vulnerable, finding out, that's so useful. I mean, for life, as a life skill, not just to deal with your penis. If there's anyone listening to this, and they think, okay, well, maybe I feel like I've got the beginnings of an issue here. This is kind of unlocked things. What would you say they do? Well, I don't want to be biased, but <laughs> Mojo is a good, a good start because mm. not being able to get it up one evening is perfectly normal. Could be mm. down to anything from being drunk or tired or shock horror, just not in the mood. Mm. But yeah, I think you should kind of reach out for support, even if that is at a distance with kind of online good information i'll I'll Mm. qualify that with saying it has to be good information a lot of which is free um but whatever you can do to kind of calm yourself down and reassure yourself that that isn't an issue that that happened and it's perfectly normal um i think is a good thing and a way of uh nipping it in the bud if you like before it kind of ingrains itself and turns into some form of performance anxiety Mm -hmm. Angus, thank you so much for speaking to us. Well, I've had a really, really great time. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Oh, it's been brilliant to have you. It's the mailbag. Send Kate your queries to podcast at hatch.com. It's the mailbag. Send Kate your queries. Podcast at hatch. with two C's. Hello there. I have a query for Kate. I would like to know when the real sex education mailbag starts. The real sex education mailbag starts right now. Thank you. Thank you so much again to Angus for taking the time to speak to us today. Some really useful stuff there for people who are currently experiencing ED. And on top of that, we'll have some more resources and support in the show notes. And I would suggest that you take a look. If you have never had a problem with ED, take a look at some of this now so that if it does happen to you, then you won't be feeling, oh my goodness, this is a terrible thing that only happens to really, really strange people and I'm probably dying and this is awful and I'm never going to get right again, which is the kind of thing that people often do say. But if you already know about it, then when it happens, you'll be probably saying, oh, that's interesting that this has happened. Let's just see if it'll go away if I just leave it alone and wait Mm, mm. and don't worry too much. Exactly right. So check those resources out and as well as mum's blog. Speaking of mum, it's time for her to answer some questions that you've sent into us on Instagram. We're at Real Sex Ed Pod or through our email podcast at hattrick.com. Mum, our first question is from Ali. And Ali asks, the last few men I've slept with have all not been able to come when we've had sex. My friends say they're finding the same thing. What's going on? Oh, (laughs) wow. So there's a bit of a belief that this is called delayed ejaculation. So DE. And I mean, it, it can be due to anxiety. Mm. or um, about all sorts of things. I mean, uh, uh, about getting it right, about uh, you might be a fear of pregnancy. You know, there's, mm. all, there's all sorts of things that, that could be happening. Sometimes it's associated with excessive porn use sometimes, mm. or it's quite common in people who've been to boarding school, as is early ejaculation. Because sometimes, you, you know, there's a need to control ejaculation because of privacy. Mm. And so some people have learned to not climax, you know, so that they don't have any embarrassing mess or anything like that. So Mm. they they do. And then it's quite difficult to undo that. 
yeah, at a yeah. later stage. So there are just lots and lots. I mean, there's many reasons for it as there are people. And it used to be thought that it was really, really hard to treat. It's actually not as difficult as all that. And it's much more common than people used to think. It's not something that people talk about because a lot of people would sort of maybe tell their mates and they say, what are you complaining about? You know, exactly, I love yeah. that problem. Yeah. But obviously it isn't okay to just keep plugging away. One of the problems with some men is that they believe that intercourse is going to be the way that their partner will climax. And often that isn't the case, Mm. but they've somehow got into this belief system. And then they keep on going, hoping that it'll be okay. And sometimes the partner feels that they're not arousing enough and they worry about that. And then the the one with the problem is thinking, oh God, I've upset them and what should I do now? And then they, then it becomes even harder to come. Mm. So that you've got this, this sort of vicious cycle going on. Mm. I mean, once people relax, it's usually not a problem. And it doesn't actually matter. If you want to get pregnant, it might be a problem. But otherwise, it, you don't have to climax all the time. And once you accept that, usually it happens, it starts mm. to happen. Mm. And it's a bit like women who can't climax because they're worried about their partner, or they're feeling they should hurry up, they're worried they're not doing it right, or they're afraid of letting go because something that, or overwhelming might happen. Mm. Same, same sort of thing. Um, all sorts of reasons why it can happen, but it but it's definitely something that sex therapy help, helps with, and also just relaxing and not worrying about it. Yeah, I think that's a really good comparison with a lot of women who who it's funny they they're sort of, you know they're used to not maybe coming every time you know mm. uh, and maybe are comfortable with se- maybe maybe uncomfortable with sex being like that, but also have maybe been like oh well I have to be comfortable with it. So it's funny that maybe some guys need to do the same. Well, it, it's, it's, we're back to that, that idea that, that there are these jobs that you have to do yeah. and one of them includes climaxing. And there are some conditions, some surgery and things like that makes it not possible to ejaculate anymore, but you can still orgasm. And it's about an average of three minutes that people are actually having intercourse. So if you're sort of going on for half an hour, you're going to get bruised and quite sore, both of you. Mm. So, it, you know, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah. tr- you know, just keep forcing things, just stop and do something else yeah there you go right let's stop and do another question this one is from anonymous who says i cry after sex it's always been this way with boyfriends one night stands or even on my own how can i stop Why do you want to stop? It's okay. It's just an emotional release. And tears are there for all sorts of reasons. It's not just when you're sad. It sounds like you find it embarrassing, but it's your way of letting out the emotion. It's fine. Mm. Not a problem. When you stop worrying about it, probably go away, actually. For this person, it's a body's way of being like, that was pretty intense, wasn't it? Let's have a little cry. Just a way of releasing the tension. Yeah, It is. I suppose one night stands might be a little surprised. Um, I don't know. You know, maybe you're saying that because because you're a boy. Because <laughs> um, there seem to be lots and lots of books that I've read where people talk about doing this. So so women probably mm. talk about doing it much more than men do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely I've heard about this happening before. But I just mm. I wonder whether you know. Basically, I think if you're there and someone's crying, you could, there's lots of reasons they could be crying. And I think mm. crying is often seen as, you know, this is this hasn't been the greatest thing in the world. So it might freak the other person out. They might feel like they've done something wrong. Or but the- we're getting back to all these rules about how things should be, how sex should be, how people should be, whether we're allowed to show emotion or not. I mean, this is an intense personal act. Mm. And so crying seems really appropriate. I mean, I don't, it doesn't sound... I don't see why it should be a problem. I mean, you know, other people, do you know something? Some people laugh. (laughs) Yeah, that would also be, that would be, you know, you you might not enjoy that if you're on the receiving end of that. Um, Well, I don't know. At least it's jolly. I mean, either either way, it's about emotion, isn't it? And, you know, it depends on which way you take it. When someone's crying, that usually means that they're not having a good time. And I think that's what the worry is. It doesn't usually mean that. Lots of people cry when they're happy. That is true. Yeah, maybe I'm and, wrong. And you know, if you go to if I, if you go to see Coldplay or something, I don't know. Well, lots of people cry watching Coldplay. You can understand that. Oh, but bloody you know. hell. <laughs> don't come for Chris Martin and the boys like that. <laughs> um, no, Savage. but you- <laughs> biggest band in the world being taken down by Kate Campbell. 
Yeah, I've got no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's yeah. And I mean, we saw we, them together live, and all you could talk about is how terrible the sound system was. The sound was terrible. What are I mean, you, you, what you wouldn't know if they mean? were playing well or not. <laughs> it was such, and a, everyone was shouting was, so much you couldn't hear anything. Yeah, that was me next to you, loving it. <laughs> Who's the? What was the best gig you've ever been to? Oh, that best one would be our Thomas Tallis. Um, Jesus, didn't I come to that? <laughs> No, you came to a play. Also, at the Thomas Globe. Tallis. Sorry, hang on a second. Thomas Tallis. Am I thinking of the same bloke? This is the guy from like the 16th century. Yeah, he's dead. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not from Tudor times. Not quite that old. No. But um but no, but the, no wonder that, you hate Coldplay. There's this one thing where they have forty two voices and it's just so magical. Mm. In those days they used to say that the music was so profound and amazing that ordinary people shouldn't be allowed to hear it. It was only like the king people like that, mm. royalty, who were allowed to listen to it. And because people would get overwhelmed and start crying. Mm. So we're back to where with we said, you know, get over, because it was just with the emotional experience of it, because yeah. it was really amazing. And certainly 42 voices just singing, oh, my God, yes, you, there's no way you can listen to that and, and keep Not your eyes cry. dry. Yeah, well, got to be done. Excellent. Well, we've come full circle with that. You're going to cry at Thomas Tallis and you're going to cry in bed. <laughs> Good. Right. That's that for today's episode. Thank you so much again to Angus Barge for speaking to us. Thank you as well to Kate Campbell for her wisdom, which apparently (laughs) stretches all the way back to the 16th century. Thanks, Mum. Thanks, Dix. Thank you guys as well for listening. Make sure you're here same time next week for some more real sex education. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Diggory Waite, and the executive producer is Claire Broughton. The Real Sex Education is a hat-trick podcast. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, accredited sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But yes, Diggory does wish his mother was played by Gillian Anderson. 